We've had some preamble, and uh, now that we're live, we'll, uh, we'll do some introductions, and I'll start. I'll say, my name is Matt Carter, and uh, I'm in the shop right now, and I'm balanced on a, uh, a workbench of some sort that's on wheels, and it's wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, so if there's a slight chance that I might disappear from the screen, if I don't cut up in, in five to ten seconds, call for help. Will do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my cat's clawing at me. I'm Natasha McClellan. I'm the artistic director of Theatre New Brunswick. I'm on a very sturdy chair. Uh, but if I fall off, it will be because I'm sipping wine. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Bern Thiessen, and I'm a playwright, and I'm working on Bluebirds as part of this festival. And I am also sitting on a fairly stable chair, but I do have a blind dog who is not sometimes cooperative, and so he may bark during this, these proceedings, and I may have to go deal with him. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, not, and I'm here in Edmonton, Alberta, where it's 5 o'clock, which is cocktail hour. <laughs> cocktail is what I'm going to do and I've never made this cocktail before so um, let's see I'm going to make this up as I go along here we have a cocktail shaker and I'm going to put in uh, this is a lone pine gin this is a local distillery here in Edmonton that's just started up beautiful gin and vodkas and so I'm going to um, let's see how can I put this okay so you know there's six parts of a play y'all y'all know that and so let's start with the plot so, you know, this is going to be the plot right here of our cocktail, which is, you know, a good two ounces of gin there, because why not? And then, uh, and then uh, we're going to say this is uh, the character, which is, you know, a little bit of lemon. We're going to squeeze some lemon in here uh, into our cocktail. This is going to be the, the character of our cocktail. I love this common as you go along and you know because we're doing bluebirds i guess the blueberries will be the theme of our play you see how smart i am like doing this it's incredible i'm literally <laughs> making up this as i go along not the cocktail necessarily but the plot stuff and uh and then what else do i have here i have some time some fresh time which will um, in that bad boy. well i don't know be the 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 dialogue let's say, of our cocktail, and the dialogue, which is the fourth thing on the list. That's great. Time is great. Good job. It smells, it, it smells so good. It smells amazing. It does smell great, yeah. I smell it all the way over there. <laughs> smell it. Do you, do you guys remember when Bruno Gerussi had his own cooking show back in the 70s or 80s? You're probably too old or too young to remember that. It was called Celebrity Chefs or something. And then we're, I don't have a muddler, so I'm going to use this to muddle the cocktail. So here we go with some rhythm. That's the, that's the fifth element of the play. <laughs> the, rhythm. the rhythm of the play. Okay. The rhythm of the play okay. is the muddling yep. Yep. of all of these ingredients together. Into a clear and, um, 
Yeah. You see, I'm giving a lesson in playwriting right here. <laughs> I do this. If yeah. this doesn't go viral, I don't know. <laughs> um, sorry, there's a there's something stuck in here. Okay, there we go. Um, there's some, and there's then, some air stuck on your rhythm. <laughs> yeah, I didn't muddle these enough. I got to do some more muddling. Ah. Some more rhythm and song here. Some more muddling. This is a musical. Uh, of of the uh, of the blueberries, I think this was the wrong thing to muddle with, but that's okay. I don't want to take up too much time doing this. And then, of course, we're going to pour it all over the setting, which is the sixth element. Just the ice. We're going to pour it all over the setting. We're going to we're going to add. Oops. We're going to add. Hang on. We're going to add a little something, which is a little splash. Of soda, just a little splash of soda. So we're beyond our six elements of the play. So now I'm going for a rewrite here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, last but not least, I'm going to throw in a little garnish here, garnish. And lime in the corner. Yeah. And my friends, there you have it: the blueberry, the bluebirds blueberry cocktail. See you. All right. Fantastic. That was an analogy. That's quite nice. I like that. It needs a little bit more of a stir, but it's good. Good. I don't remember uh, Bruno Gerussi's cooking show, but your uh, your cocktail improvising uh, reminded me of another famous Canadian cooking show called Just Like Mom. Oh, yeah. Where Hello. Uh, children would throw in ingredients and their parents would have to eat it. <laughs> but That's awesome. <laughs> When it comes to cocktails, um, I'd be a little bit more open to uh, to sampling. Yeah. <laughs> also a cooking show on Canadian television called The Galloping Gourmet, which my mother oh, watched yeah. in the afternoons. But Bruno Gerussi's was called Celebrity Chefs. And basically, if you don't know who Bruno Gerussi was, he's a famous Stratford actor who then went on to be in the Beach Comers, which was a huge series. Oh. And Bruno, uh, then after he was finished with the Beach Comers, he had the show on on CBC called Celebrity Chefs, and he invited all these celebrities on, and basically he just got hammered during the whole thing. He was, had this big glass of wine, and he poured in the Greek wine, and they just get loaded throughout this entire cooking show, and at the end, they'd, they'd eat something, and he'd have all these, you know, Canadian famous people on, you know. So, oh, wow. look at some, some of those. So, anyway, that's my that's my version today of this cooking show. My chair just broke, can you believe that? Matt, I should be in the shop. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up now. Because we won't have a serious discussion about playwriting. Oh yes, yes. For God's sake, make it serious. Absolutely. I love the you drinking? approach that we've set. What are you drinking, right? Natasha? I've got some rose left over for Thanksgiving. Goes good with the Thanksgiving meal. Matt, That's are you I'm... imbibing in anything? Uh, I'm drinking uh, reheated coffee from this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's probably five or six hours old. And uh, now that I'm in the shop, it tastes like sawdust. So, wow. yeah. So that's well, I'm different. Glad, but... I'm glad, Matt, that you're not drinking in the shop, especially with those, you know, buzz saws and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to play it safe for this because... Um, I already don't know what to expect, so I wanted to have some sort of guard up. <laughs> awesome. Well, I suppose yeah. we do have to talk about plays. Yes, okay, we do. Okay, all right. We can talk about that a little. Yeah. What do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Matt, do you have a particular question? I can start off. What do you think? Well, I think maybe uh, since this is sort of our pre-festival kickoff for the fall festival and new plays, Natasha, maybe you could just uh, give us like the Coles notes on the festival um, yeah. idea behind it and what we're doing. Yeah, well, since we're not uh, making plays this year, um, and by making plays, I mean having audiences in, we're spending our time developing new plays. Because the process of putting playwrights in a room with actors and directors and dramaturges to work on them. And that's how uh, Vern is here, because he's not only writing one for us, but he's doing some dramaturgy on other plays. Vern is the only New Brun uh, playwright not from New Brunswick or born in New Brunswick, calling him our guest. Um, but I think that the process 
that we're undertaking is mysterious to a lot of people, even who make theater. So that was kind of the impetus behind this. It was, well, if we're going to present 13, 14 play readings, we, let's talk about it. So, so that when people tune in and they see the actors reading, uh, if you've never seen that process before, it's kind of nice to know what the work is that we're doing, you know? So that's kind of the premise that we're developing a lot. And so we're doing two play readings a week, but the company and the artists are doing so much more. There is so much happening at TMB right now. It's insane. Uh, is that, that, I'll leave it there, and then one of you can jump in, I think. No, that's, that's, a, that's a good setup. Um, is your mic on? Like, I can hear you fine, but for whatever reason on my screen, it says your mic has an extra. I guess Nikki would tell us if. You yeah. Do you know what it is? It's that the mic on my laptop doesn't work, so I have my uh, phone. <laughs> she just texted. Oh, it's fine. So my phone is here, and I use it. Okay. And it says Glenn's iPhone, so don't get confused. Glenn is not talking. It's me. Oh, good to know. There's uh, Okay, so, but um, to sort of bring you both into this, uh, the topic of the festival, in a way, um, development process. I, uh, I, I'm not a playwright. I work at a theater company, and I learn a lot of this stuff by being around and listening and having conversations. Uh, so, um, but I am an artist, I'm a musician and a photographer, so I understand about creation, um, but the development process in terms of dramaturgy is always, I've always thought that was quite interesting in that you take this thing that you've created and you give it to other people to cut apart or, you know, or maybe you don't cut apart. I don't know. Let's, maybe we could talk about that. Uh, Fern, you've done you do dramaturgy, you, you're involved in this festival at that capacity as well, and you were uh, you were a dramaturge for Notable Acts this past summer, yep. and I'm assuming other times. What is it like, um, how do you approach the process when you someone gives you a script and says, uh, have at it? Well, I would say that, thinking of, again, I'm uh, using what we have in the room here, you're in the shop, and I think it's very similar to um, being in a workshop. I mean, it's called a workshop for a reason, and that is that we're testing stuff out. So, you know, you were talking about tearing it apart. Yeah, that's part of it. It's kind of like being in your uh, garage with your, you know, your, with your car. If you're one of those kinds of people who likes to pull apart their car engine and see how it works and then put it back together, if you're that kind of person. Or if you're somebody who likes to do woodworking or um, uh, those kinds of things. You know, playwrights build plays. They don't write them. And I think that's a really important distinction because the word write, W-R-I-G-H-T, means like you're a builder, you're a maker. And so you're, you're, you're actually building a world. And it's, it's much more concrete than people think. And so I was joking early on when I was mixing this cocktail about the six parts of the play, but really those six things are pretty physical. They're, they're tangible things, right? The plot is something that is laid out. And characters are things that you have to develop in certain ways. And you have to know what the theme of your play is, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, so the process of dramaturgy, which is this weird word that means a million different things, is really at its core... Uh, the etymology of that word is drama, which means to do in Greek, and turgy, which means workings, the workings of. And so you're really trying to figure out how does the drama work? What makes it work? What, how is it put together? How is it quilted? How is it your painter, or how is it composed if you're a photographer? You're looking at how the thing is put together and, and, and what we do when we're developing new plays is we often just tear the whole thing apart like you would a car engine, look at the separate parts, put it back together so that it runs smoothly and more smoothly until you can put it into the chassis and take it for a test drive down the road, which is what the public readings are about. So public readings are test drives of plays. And so you're, you're testing it out to see, you know, whether it could take a, a turn at a certain speed or... You know, I'm really flogging this metaphor, and I think that I'll just stop now. But I'm hoping that people will get the idea that, you know, if you think about new play development, it's really about um, putting things together like a model. 
and seeing if it, it if it if it holds together. And it just takes a long time to do that. I've been working on bluebirds in various forms since 2017. Like, you know, and it's not that I work on it every day, but it just takes a long time to get something just right. Mm. Yeah. It's funny because I've been noticing Matt's been writing these really nice um, pieces about some of the playwrights participating in the fall festival. And some, uh, you know, some of them have been remarking on how different the process is for everyone. You know, some people like sit and stew for a long time over a draft and then it comes out quickly and then they do a workshop, maybe two. And uh, some people just write lots and lots of drafts you know, like building it in a different way. I find that fascinating, having been involved in a few workshops over the years. I love watching the way writers work because everyone is so different. Yeah, I guess everybody, everybody is. Everybody creates differently. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say, Matt? I said that. Everybody creates differently. And, you know, speaking from other art forms, I, some people – can, uh, I admire those artists that, that just, all right, what are we here to do? We're going to do that? Cool. Let's do it. This, 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 here you go. And can give you something that, that you admire and respect. And then other people need the details and they need to, I guess that's just how everybody kind of approaches their work, uh, in various ways like that. I know, uh, I know some people are sticklers for details and won't even begin a process before they have all the information. And then there are others who just, oh, I'm going to start and we'll figure it out as I go along, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, it's important to realize uh, that it's not a fact, you know, playwriting isn't a factory, but it is a craft. And so, again, going back to our, you know, alcoholic beverage thing here today, you know, there's a difference between drinking a Miller Lite and drinking your local craft beer. Um, because one was produced in a factory and, and one, you know, wasn't. It had some care tech into it. So, you know, there are cookie cutter plays out there, and uh, and God, thank God for those and the people that write them. They're making a lot of money, which I'm, or some money anyway. I'm happy. To <laughs> say. Um, and some of the most famous playwrights in the world are very much formulaic in their writing, and that's okay. But like songwriting, are... really. Sorry to interrupt, right. but it's like like songwriting, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's great. It's different. Yeah. It's the the like the, you have a structure like, that you work from. Like okay, you know, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, yeah. outro. Exactly. But everybody has a variation on that, right? Everybody's yeah. got you know whether it's um, you know everybody's got they're going to have their own rhyme, whether the the rhyming scheme is the same. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, it's all variations on, on the same thing. We're all playing with the same chords and the same, uh, notes, which are those six things that I mentioned at the beginning and everything else is just how you put them together and how you mix them up. And then to see, you know, the, if the play is palatable or, or, or even of interest to the audience, which is the ultimate people who decide whether it's any good or not. Yeah. Interesting. So now everybody uh, has a, like a, a formula that they choose to work from. Am, am I right in thinking that? Like, uh, if you're a playwright, you you uh, you have you approach one play the same way you would approach another play. Uh, say you, two scripts that you're working on over a period of time. Is there? Do you find similarities in your own processes? <laughs> I think it really depends on, and I use this word really loosely the genre and so like bluebirds is what i would call a small cast poetic drama and so it is um it's an intimate play um it's uh, it could play in a big space but it's meant to in involve kind of deeper and uh intimate emotions which is different than if i was writing a musical or if it was different than I was writing a theater for young audiences play, which comes with its own constraints that you have to follow in order to write that kind of play. Or if I was writing a very big epic play with 12 or 15 people in it, that demands different skills and a different way of constructing things because you have 
it's very different constructing a play that has three people on the stage than it is constructing a play that has 15 people on the stage. So right. it's just, um, so I would say, no, I would say the approaches can be very, very different. And, you know, the more genres you've worked in, the more tools you learn to, um, to release those plays from, you know, the, if you were a sculptor, releasing it from the stone kind of thing. And right. I guess just, where I was, yeah, I was going to follow that up with that. Like, have you ever received a script to, to, um, for, to, for dramaturgy and uh, read through it and thought, I have no idea where this person is coming from. Like, I don't know where to begin to find, you know, because it may obviously makes sense. Like a, um, like a hypothetical playwright that gives you something that's, that's completely off the wall makes sense to them. They were confident enough to say, Hey Vern, can you check this out? Or Hey Natasha, like, what do you think of this? How do you find, how do you, how do you take a piece of art like that and find your position within it to begin uh, analyzing it in a way that your brain analyzes it? Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Yeah, it does. So when I'm, uh, when I'm practicing dramaturgy on somebody else's play, like I am with uh, Alex Ryu on this play, uh, the Kelpie for the, the, the festival, that's the reverse kind of experience of being a playwright to some extent. You come at this thing, you may not understand it. That's not to say I don't understand Alex's play, it's pretty clear, but it's it's, but if I was in the situation that you just described, Matt, I would look at this piece of art in front of me and I would start to say, how does this work? And um, assuming that it does work, not assuming that it doesn't work. Yeah. So you have to assume that everything is there that is making this work, even if I don't understand it. Because we have live playwrights, the great thing is I can say to a playwright, can you... Tell me about this. Tell me about this work. What, what is your intention here? How is this work built in your own mind? So I get into the head of the playwright. It's like being in their house and giving get, getting a tour of all the individual rooms of the house um, and being able to, oh, oh, I understand how this house is built and how it's organized. Now I understand this. Now I can say to Alex, you know what? Uh, or whoever, I can say, you know what, you think that that room has a bunch of skeletons in that room, but actually they're uh, penguins. I don't know, I'm making things up now. But you know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. You, can, you can start to shine light into those dark rooms of the playwright's mind and kind of go, I can totally see that this is happening. I'm not so sure about that. And then you let them figure out how to... Um, solve those dramaturgical problems sometimes you just go here's an idea sometimes you go i'm not sure how to do that sometimes you ask questions you use a bunch of different tools to tease out what that playwright really needs to do to make their play better and to communicate their intention and to communicate their idea of how the play works okay does that make sense I think so. That's actually like an analogy I used to use too, because I used to say it is like going into somebody's house in the dark. It really is. But um, every time you um, every time you figure out one little piece, like every time they tell you something that makes you go, "Oh, I see." It's like being in a dark house and a light comes on, and you see, you know, you see some hardwood floor, but then. You know, then they explain something else to you and you turn around and it's like, there's a lamp on over here. So you get a little bit more and then you start, as you figure out pieces of it, you start to see where the gaps are. Like, where are the places that I don't have light yet? I don't understand how to get from this room to this room. Uh, and it becomes less about you and more about just trying to figure out, well, then, then what is this? But that was really nice for, you know, you do have to assume it's all there because, um, if if I when I get nervous when I hear people thinking that they're in a workshop to fix the play, you know, uh, or like you know to make it better and stuff like that, I was like ah, that's a that's a tough place to start because if you already think you're better than it or you're capable of fixing it, ugh, you should you be know? you should be in another business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You should be in criticism or right. Reviewing. 
which is a very valuable and important part of the theater, but it's not an important part of the workshop. Yeah, 100%. Okay, I want to jump in and ask a question. Uh, and I'm going to ask this of you, Vern. And Matt, you can use you can answer it using uh, music, if you like, or photography uh, to help illuminate it. But the... Um, I wrote a few plays when I was younger. I haven't written in a while. So I've been through the workshop process as a playwright. I'm curious about, Vern, your journey through being a playwright in the workshop from when you were younger, inexperienced, to now you've got plays under your belt. Has the process changed? Uh, because we've got so many playwrights in this festival. We've got actors turned playwright. We've got emerging playwrights. And we've got vets. So... Uh, do you think, while it might not be a rule that this applies to them all, there could be some emerging playwrights who are cool as cucumbers in this thing. But, you know, what is the, what's the journey through the workshop for the playwright? That's a big question. I know. <laughs> I, I want to know what he thinks. <laughs> well, there's lots of stuff buried in there. So the, the first question was, have things changed? Mm. And the answer to that is yes. And then the second question was, what has the journey been? And then the third question is, what is the journey generally as a playwright through workshop? That's what I understood those three questions to be. Am I? Yeah. Sorry, there was a lot of them there. What would you What would you like me to answer first? Mm. I'm mulling my blueberries some more. <laughs> I thought you were being pensive and thoughtful. <laughs> no, well, I'm just mulling the blueberries some more. I guess I'm being pensive and thoughtful as I mull them. What would you like me to answer first? Uh, how has it changed for you? We'll start with you. Well, I've been writing plays for, uh, you know, 30 years. And I started writing as an actor, writing plays for myself to act in and that was great and I learned a lot and so the workshops were sometimes about trying to figure out uh, the play I guess when I was a, a younger playwright because it came from an acting tradition I, I spent a lot of time pretending that I was acting in the plays because that was the only way I could understand how the plays worked and as time has progressed, I, I now can I can telescope out from that. I don't have to do that as much anymore. That's just years of experience, you know. It's just, it's a sh you know, there's lots more shortcuts for me now yeah. just because I've done, you know, I've written probably 25 full-length plays and, you know, a dozen other, other plays. So it's just, you know, you just learn through the process how to cut through things that early in my career I'd be smoking a pack of cigarettes over one line. You know, and like, you know, I'd be, I'd be super, super stressed out about working or we're working. And now I see it much more as a bigger picture thing as a, I'm looking at the, at the full view of the thing and realizing that things need, that the workshop is there to change little things. But as I was saying today, at the end of the four hour Zoom workshop with Alex, I said to him something that has not changed. And that is that a workshop for me as a playwright is still far more exhausting than a rehearsal process. Mm -hmm. uh, because the workshop is where you really have to make critical and key decisions. Um, because by the time you're in rehearsal, you don't have time to make those decisions anymore. The machine of the theater takes over, the big meat grinder of the theater, the director, <laughs> the actors, the designers, stage managers, sound, you know, sound design. That whole thing takes over and that is, has that energy and that, you know, that ship has sailed, that train is taken off, that, you know, that horse is out of the barn, whatever analogy you want to use. But once you're in, in rehearsal for a play, you have very little control over it anymore. And so the real work of developing a play, the exhausting work is really in a workshop where the emphasis is on you, it's on you and the play and everybody's there to serve that. Whereas in production, everybody's there in rehearsal. Everybody's there to serve the production and the vision of the director. Your your time is over by the time that maybe that third rehearsal is done. So, um, you know, you just go 
sayonara play and oh, I hope the best for you. <laughs> um, so that I guess would be the big thing is, is that I've learned to use, I've learned to chill out in the workshop and yet use it more for my advantage. Not a good answer. Is that the, what you're looking for maybe? Yeah, that's great. I like that. Have you ever, um, like you mentioned these spots where you might uh, smoke a pack of cigarettes trying to figure out one line of dialogue. Have you ever had these, these situations where you've hummed and hawed so long on a certain aspect of a play and then someone else reads it and uh, interprets it differently, as in like uh, it may be like a key significant moment for you, but then um, someone else approaches it and says, well, I think the part before that was, was actually more important and maybe you don't have to, uh, maybe you shouldn't have, uh, spent an afternoon, uh, trying to figure out what's out. <laughs> oh, yeah, about. absolutely. And I also just want to mention that I'm eating blueberries off of this cheese grater, which I'm using <laughs> the model. experience like I do um, that, that we don't have our own dramaturgs mm. and I rely just on, as much on my dramaturg on any process for bloopers it happens to be Louise Case Morris in Calgary I I rely on her dramaturgy as much as somebody else is relying on my dramaturg so I have to have a dramaturg too it doesn't like suddenly find you go, ah, yes, I have all the secrets to dramaturgy, now I can practice them. Because <laughs> when you're working on a play, you can't see the forest for the trees. Right. Okay? So you, I, anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I can't write a play on my own. A, you need directors, you need dramaturgs, you need playwrights, uh, sorry, writer, uh, directors, and most importantly, you need actors. Um, because that's who you're writing for. You're writing for the actor's voice. That's your communication tool. They're the people who are delivering your thing to the audience. And so I, I tend to focus more on whether actors or not are tuning into the work yeah. um, and able to comprehend the work in a way. And that has saved me from the pack of cigarettes a day, is trusting yeah. the actors more uh, than, uh, than me worrying about something. That's that one thing. Question? I think that's great. I think there's one thing, and this is going to generalize because I also know, I, I, but I'll start with this. Um, one thing I've noticed over the years of working on predominantly new plays is that some playwrights are really attached to their words and their rhythm, and some playwrights aren't. Some playwrights are like, just, just this is the information that get, has to get out. How would you say it? And I remember you doing that in rehearsal for Pugwash a few times. I directed Vern's play Pugwash, and you, you would say sometimes to actors who were going with a line, you're like, well, just how would you say it then, you know? And I really appreciated that um, because there was, to you, there was a trust, A, in that they knew what they were doing, but also to be like, the information has to get out. But then, because I don't want to generalize, there are playwrights who stick to a rhythm, stick to words, and that works fine for them too, you know? Like, it's such a weird thing. Everybody is so different. They are different, and in that respect, for example, if you're uh, dealing with um, somebody like Colleen Murphy, you know, one of our preeminent playwrights in the country, who's, you know, in my mind, one of the gutsiest, uh, most fearless playwrights um, in Canada. And, like, she just works and works and works and works and works on that play and is very late to give it to other people. And so by the time she's reaching the workshop and actor phase, she's really finessing stuff. But she didn't come from an acting tradition. Hmm. She, you know... Aaron Bushkowski in British Columbia, he comes from a poetry tradition. He's not an actor. So he will work in a specific way, and eventually he will launch the play on the actors at a very particular time that is beneficial to him. I, who still do, do a little schmacting and directing, like I want to I want to get that play in front of actresses pretty, pretty early. Not the first draft, but usually pretty soon after that, because I want to... I. To me, that's where I hear whether the play is working or not. But that, 
but that's because I'm an actor or I was an actor. So I think it, that's the difference a lot of time is did the playwright have acting experience? Yeah. Because if they do, it's very, very different than if they didn't. Um, it's like me being a filmmaker. Like I didn't grow up with a camera, right, in front of my eye. Um, but if you did, if you were taking pictures since you were a kid, then, you know, you're going to pick up a film camera and go, oh, I know how to do this. You're going to trust the camera in a weird kind of way. Or trust the paintbrush, right, Matt? Or trust, yeah. you're going to trust your fingers to do the work on the guitar. So it's like, it's like, what, what do you feel comfortable with? And that, I think, you know, every playwright has their own way of working and you have to, um, to some extent, um, respect it. But those, those kind of, those playwrights who are fussy about words have to realize that eventually it will hit the big meat grinding machine called production and then all bets are off. <laughs> because you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly some actor cacks out and they have to bring another man and they're fired or God knows what happens. The set burns down and like, you know what I mean? Like shit happens in the theater, which is why we all love it. Right. He said, yeah, you know what? I couldn't get you that prop. So now you've got a mime it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so things happen. And then because by the time production hits, it's like, it's like you, get, you just have to go, bye-bye. Bye, play. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Get my oh, I, love, I love the meat grinder analogy that you've used twice now. About it's not mine. I can say it. That's like Robert Lepage's. I like Robert Lepage's, but that's his, his analogy, not mine. And Matt, Matt's sitting in the meat grinder right now. He's in the shop. <laughs> right. Well, I'm just going to top off my gym. No, good, good. But I want to know from your point of view, Matt, like when you see a new play being read, even if it's just with like, you know, um, uh, with scripts in hand, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, do you like that more than seeing a full production? Because some people do. Uh, I love sitting in on first reads uh, for productions here. It's a, uh, it's uh, I usually skim a play when I know that it's something that we're going to be working on, but don't thoroughly read it because I like to actually save myself for that excitement. Um, because there's so many things about the the theater process that I find fascinating, uh, and they may seem uh, elementary to people who have uh, spent their life in theater. But uh, when I when I uh, just hear, like, first attempts at these characters, like, for an ensemble, um, instantly, the, the life, there's, like, a, there's, like, instant magic for, for uh, you know, a theater novice or whatever you would call me uh, sitting in on this experience. And to see... To see, like, uh, to experience the first reading and get an idea of the characters and how people are approaching the characters. And I like to watch, I like that a lot. And I almost like that maybe more than the final production. And not because the final productions aren't great, but because um, I work in the environment where the production takes place. So I, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, I guess uh, you lose that sort of initial excitement that uh, that comes from like a first exposure. I guess does that make sense? Yeah, but it's also in your imagination, right? So if I said to you, is it is it the, is it different reading the play and then hearing the play? What is your response to that? Oh, huge! I, I uh, the characters that I create in my head when I read a book or when I read a play. Um, you know, they're not professional. <laughs> so when I actually hear people who know how to bring a character to life, um, bringing a character to life right before my eyes, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love it. And, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of, um, radio dramas. I listen to, uh, every night I listen to radio dramas when I go to sleep, like old CBC stuff, like, uh, Nightfall and stuff from the eighties. 
and uh, I just I eat that stuff up. And that's very, I think that's why I enjoy like a first read experience is because I can just close my eyes and, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in my imaginary world where I love to, uh, I love to experience stories that way. Uh, productions are also, you know, cool lights and costumes and stuff, but I really, <laughs> I really, I really love just reading. Okay. And at the risk of taking over this conversation, I just want to ask one more question and that's of Natasha. And to just flip this around and kind of go like from your perspective as obviously you're a great actor. You, I've never, I don't think I've ever read it in any of your plays, but now I want to. No, it's uh, all right. Um, no, I think I want one in my inbox tomorrow morning. Is, um, <laughs> is like from your perspective as a director, let's just say, what is, what's the process like for you? Mm. Um, that, what Matt was just talking about there, that first read, the first time the actors that you've brought into the room read a play is remarkable. It's really like, because, uh, and often because I'm a producer too, I've often cast the plays that I direct. So I've kind of been involved for a long time before we get in the room. And even when you think you know an actor, the first time they read it for you and they show you something that you didn't see before, uh, it, it's, it's electric for me. I love it so much. Um, even sometimes at first, and if any actor that I've ever directed watches this, don't think I'm making this about you. But sometimes they read it and you're like, no, that's no, that's not it. But then you come around because you're like, you see, it's like what you do when you're dramaturging a play. When you hang in with artists and you, you see where they're going and what they're creating, um, I find that really beautiful to watch people create and work together. So yeah, I, I like that. And then of course, rehearsal goes through a weird process. Go ahead. Were you going to ask? No, no, no. Keep going. I, but I want to say something about that in a moment. Yeah. Well then rehearsal, like you were talking about this meat grinder. So if we're talking about rehearsal of the play, there's, there's a, a rhythm to rehearsal where week one people are confident and they're bright and they're charming and they hang out every night and they're trying new things. And then in week two, everybody kind of gets slowly crankier and they don't understand why they took this job anymore and they hate it and the script is the problem and they can't memorize it and everything seems to fall apart. And then in week three, uh, it starts coming back slow, but deeper and, uh, and more beautiful every time. And that's that's something I love. I love watching actors take that leap from coming out of that thing of, oh, God, I'm the worst actor, to, oh, no, I've got this. Oh, no, I think it's okay. You know, there's there's just a beautiful cycle that I like in rehearsal. I wanted to build on what you said, which was that, and, and apply it to the workshop, because the thing about, the other key thing about a workshop for playwrights is, having a great director and uh, having been through many workshops um, to have a really great director in the room means that as a playwright you are witness to uh, your play surprising you and suddenly the play doesn't become something that you wrote it exists outside of yourself and it sounds really ooga booga, but it's it's very tactile and actually very uh, physical and uh, and practical. So, for example, um, Natasha in this workshop uh, of Bluebirds might ask a question of an actor that I had never thought of, right? And she's going like, "How? Like, what did you? How long ago was it? What did you? You know, like just key questions that she has to ask as a director." to actually, if she was producing the, uh, the play. And so great workshop directors like Natasha will actually pretend it's a rehearsal and will actually act as if it's a rehearsal. So instead of going, how can we fix this play? They're trying to unearth what's in the play. They're trying to peel back the play like an onion as if it was in rehearsal. And that is so like, you, you, you don't, as a playwright, you can't, that's a gift. Because suddenly they are doing your work for you. Suddenly you're going, oh, Jesus, I never, oh, sorry, excuse my language. Oh, was that you? Suddenly you're going, uh, boy, oh, boy, I never thought about that. 
I didn't even think about that question. And geez, I guess I better fix that, writing a note on his pet pad. So a lot of the stuff that happens in a workshop is not necessarily driven by you as the playwright. You're listening to other, other like a fly on the wall, other people dis discuss your work. And if those fantastic group of artists in the room can't sort out a problem, you know it's your problem. So after, you know, they should struggle for a while, but if they can't, if they can't figure that out, then it's not clear. And th this is the other great thing about workshops that's really important as a playwright, is that it allows you to find problems that you yourself would never be able to find in your own play. Because you know what? We're just not that smart. <laughs> that's playwright. That's not. my final thought, right? <laughs> No, it's true. You know, I have a rule of thumb, which I normally go over at some point in rehearsal or in a workshop, where I say, don't tell the playwright the line doesn't work. It doesn't work until you've tried every way. I said, make it work. Make it work. Just find a way, you know, and then if it can work, it does. But the playwright can see you struggling or, you know, like I, the, the struggle is part of the work of the workshop of trying to figure it out because you can't get everything right away. That's ridiculous. So you have to figure it out. But those conversations are helpful, too. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah good, actors, get... man. good actors will go to the floor for you as a playwright. And, you know, you can tell a huffy actor, you know, who's like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, those people shouldn't be in the room, really. But you can tell an actor who's like, I have tried every single way of doing this, and it's just, and they don't say it doesn't work, but you could, you could, if you're a good playwright after 20 years of experience or a couple of years of experience, you know, you know what, that's a great actor, and they can't figure this out. So there, I'm going to go back and go not to be or not to know. <laughs> yeah. It's just not, just yeah. not working. That yeah. actor can't make that work. To be or not to see? Nah. <laughs> like you go know, through all the things and, until the actor until the actor goes the actor goes, the actor goes I don't mean emotionally easy. I mean they just feel like they're releasing something with your words. Yeah. Then you know you're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So I try to write plays that even the worst actors in the world can do, but the best actors in the world can sing. Yeah. and that's the, the that and i'm sure you know anybody can sing this land is your land and probably play it on the guitar but if you put it in the hands of like a great artist they can make that into something incredible right so that's the two things that you want to hit nice nice i've got an echo do you guys have an echo no but i yes but i think it's the gin hitting my brain <laughs> I have to do a reading of somebody else's play tonight. Oh, I just got a text. Let's we'll turn it into a comedy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. She's clearing that up for us. I love this. Okay. That's awesome. Are there any questions out there? Or is anybody listening to us at all? <laughs> or is this just for our own fun? Yeah, right? We were going to do this anyway. <laughs> it has been fun. Yeah. Are we I have gonna, no idea uh, what's going on. Yeah, we're going to keep it up for a week or something, just so that in case people are curious about it, they can watch it. Um, because, uh, yeah, I, I just in case anybody has questions about what the heck we're doing all fall. <laughs> I want to say something. I want to say, I want to make it something clear to the dozen people perhaps watching that what we're involved in here... Uh, in this uh, festival is mainly text-based work, right, Natasha? Yeah, it is mainly. There are um, there are two people working. Um, uh, two people working in the studio. One is working with other writers to build something, and one is working because she's had a, a beautiful textile piece built for her play that she's. Uh, worked on before. This is Abby Page and Natalie Sapier I'm talking about. Natalie's got people coming in to work with and help her respond to, I believe, some imagery she's created because she's a painter. She's doing more than that, but I think that's part of it. And then uh, Abby has performed her play before and has a light designer coming in to help her explore the possibility of light and these uh, textile pieces she's had made for the play. 
So it's still kind of text-based, but different. But anyway, long answer, keep going. Right, so most of like most of my work is text, not all of it, but most of it is text-based work, which means that I write the, the words, I give them to actors, they perform them, and they do the, the words in the order I wrote them. <laughs> That's the basics. What <laughs> <It> helps? Um, <laughs> But they might move them around. But if it's uh, if it's a devised show, or if there's more collaboration in the scene, and I have worked as a as a writer on that occasion, where I have worked with a designer to create a show, or I have worked with a musician to create a show, where you know I for um, one play, for example, all I I uh, the whole soundtrack, the rhythm of the show is created, and then I put words on that. Um, and it wasn't songs. It was just it was just the the rhythms of the play were created. I worked with a German company to do that. So, like, there's different ways of working, and there's different ways of workshopping. And sometimes you're all kind of in it together, and you're all having equal words. And what we're talking about in this particular situation here is where I have written a play, and then that play gets workshopped. And that, but that's not always the case. There are other models of working. I, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. How many times has Bluebirds been workshopped now, Vern? I know this is the second that I know of. Yeah. So the play was written as a very short play uh, for Theater Alberta and their Arts Trek program in Alberta, which is a training program for youth in the summer for. Uh, 13 to 18 year olds and um, they were doing my play Vimy and they wanted a companion piece that had more women and so uh, they asked me if I would write a, a short companion piece to my play Vimy which I did and that play is about 20 minutes long and then after that I got a lot of comments from the play that that short play was done a lot in high schools by high school women they there is something in that play that they were attracted to, which really surprised me and delighted me, I suppose, because as a straight old male dude, pale male dude at that, I, I, um, you know, writing uh, characters for women is, uh, is something that I, I take very seriously and that I make no assumptions that I can speak for them. So uh, then I started to develop it as a full length play and I wrote a really terrible first draft that nobody has seen except for my wife, uh, in which she said, yeah, no, that, no, you can't give that to people. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and then I kept up writing it, and then Natasha expressed some interest in, in the short piece, and then after a very long period of time, because Natasha kept on going, is that play ready yet? Is that play ready yet? And I was like, yeah, it's coming, it's coming, any months now. And finally, we got it, you know, I read it, uh, we, I figured a draft in July. We did a workshop of it in July. We're doing another one now. And I think that Natasha can t attest that there's some substantial changes that are happening to the play over the course of the summer. Would you agree? Yeah, it's really exciting. I think that if uh, uh, people in Fredericton who tuned into that reading at Notable Acts, it'll be interesting. I would actually, if anybody does watch this and has seen both readings, I'd love to hear what they think. There are some pretty substantial changes. Beautiful changes. This is the part I love. It's amazing to to read a play or to be interested in a play and work on a play that you already think is great, and then people do more work on it, and you're like, oh, my God, it's better. Uh, I love yeah, that. I'm just it's finishing a new draft now, which is even more different, So, uh, which I will deliver in the next day or two, which we'll nice. workshop on Friday. Yeah. And so, you know, I spent the weekend working on even more changes to the play. Um, so, you know, changes, uh, plays aren't finished, they're just abandoned, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I love this. And this is so exciting to me, because it's like he's talking about, there's even bigger changes, and I have to go into rehearsal with it on well, Friday know, and Saturday. So, so. I mean, I know, I know. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, then we sit down, and we're like, okay, what is it? Uh, what's it going to be? How did it change? Um, I, I don't know why people work on plays that aren't still being written. I'm so rarely in rehearsal on a play that uh, is done. It's just and then so we get to production, hopefully, eventually. And then there's even more changes because I try to allow space for designers, movement people, singing. I, give, I try to give space in my place for 
my collaborators to do some of their own work to add to the recipe of a cocktail. A cocktail. Uh, full circle. And um, so, you know, you're trying to allow other people in and not just shut it off and say, this is it. And you can't do anything but this thing. I want to make sure that people have room for interpretation and, and to move it and to, you know, move it, move the play around in all kinds of different ways that to suit their needs. Cause it shouldn't be a firm finished thing. It should be a nice piece of furniture that you, that you feel differently every time you sit on it or something. I don't know. It should be, it should, it should be something that grows like a, like a guitar. It grows with time in the amount that you play it. Nice. Nice, nice analogy. <laughs> yes. And so, um, bluebirds will be, uh, will get a reading this Sunday. This Sunday. Yep. At 2 PM. <laughs> We've talked for fifty-five minutes. Look at us. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I was, I was uh, before we opened this up. I was like, how are we going to stretch this for a half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, all you have to do is put a drink in Burn Jason's hand, and away you go. <laughs> <laughs> you guys so, are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Burn. Um, that's great. Thanks a lot, Burn. This was fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we should also mention that. Um, um, on Wednesday, on Thursday, we're doing a, a reading of uh, Norm Foster's new script, yes. Wildly Romantic. Wildly Romantic. So it's a big week. Uh, Fern Thiessen and uh, Norm Foster to kick off our Norm. ball full of new plays. Norm, the most famous playwright in Canada. Right? Two of the biggest oh. names in Canada and, right and, here. And probably the most prolific, so I look forward to that. And the funniest, let's just say that. Right. Oh my god! I was I was throwing jokes at him because uh, I'm directing that reading too, and I kept trying to make jokes with him to see if he'd laugh. And I was like, "Hey, do you find me no. funny?" <laughs> he didn't really, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he laughed a few times. He was very generous. <coughs> All right, okay. I'm gonna have something for dinner now that I finished my cocktail. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Theater New Brunswick. You guys are awesome. Thank Thanks you. a lot, man. Great to talk to you. Talk to you soon. All right. Am I leaving us or are we onward? Or, or I think Nikki's going to sign us off. Why don't we, we blow kisses to everybody and Nikki will take us out.